Hello, School Transportation Nation. Tony Corbin here. We're glad you made it to the podcast. It's brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. I see bus and Student Transportation of America, a leader in school transportation services. A little later, Mr. Ryan Gray is going to be speaking with Nate Springer, the VP of Market Development at TRC Companies, the presenter of the Advanced Clean Transportation Expo, ACT Expo as it's known. Uh, We are there as a media partner, spreading the word. They are talking about trends and electrification, energy, uh, a lot of trucking there, but uh, we're always looking to the big trends, right, Ryan? Absolutely. That's where we're always putting our thumb on the pulse. Yeah. So it's always good to look at other industries to see how kind of we can learn from them. Uh, Obviously, everybody's moving at blistering pace to try to meet all the regulatory demand uh, state by state. So they're going to kind of dive a little deeper on that and talk a little more about what the landscape looks like. Uh, But before we get to some more headlines, got a quick message. Today's tech tip is brought to you by IC Bus. Looking for ways to improve your on time performance and reduce operating costs? All IC Bus CE Series school buses come standard with a factory installed telematics device, including a five year connectivity subscription. You'll gain access to on command connection, an industry leading remote diagnostic solution providing data that is visible, easy to understand, and actionable. With OCC, your school district will have visibility to vehicle health and performance data at your fingertips, including EV specific information like state of charge and estimated range learn about other standard capabilities of their connected vehicles at icbus.com that's icbus.com hi ryan i want to welcome you to the podcast as usual my friend uh what are the top headlines of the week i know we had ghg phase three recos came out there was a lot happening in there we had obviously solar eclipse did you did you see the solar yeah, did you see it saw, partial so yeah we we everybody in the contiguous 48 if you, you know, i'm sure you saw it out there here we are a couple days later uh but there was a 115 mile wide path of total eclipse that stretched from basically south texas all the way to the tip of maine in the northeast maine uh so it uh, a lot of school districts were closed uh but some were open um hopefully everybody was safe out there and also got to uh experience a little total midday darkness a great educational opportunity for the kiddos and we won't see another one of these in the contiguous 48 till 2044 so yeah i read that i was like wow it's really like a special thing and then uh my wife goes well when was the last one we had and i had to go to the stnonline.com website to find out and it was august 21st 2017 i thought wow okay yeah there we go i don't even remember the last one yeah, I, there was more in the, uh, I believe in the in the Pacific Northwest and the in the northern part of the country saw that, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's one of those phenomenons that uh, doesn't happen all that uh, often. I remember there was one when I was a kid. I was maybe I don't know what it was, fifth or sixth grade or something like that. Um, and I remember we had to create the little like glasses and look at the 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 shadow on the concrete and all that stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, not, not, uh, the, the typical, um, uh, experience for midday routes or even, uh, end of the day routes. Um, and it was interestingly, um, I found out as I was researching this, at least one state, Ohio, uh, they classify a, uh, a total eclipse as a weather related event so that, um, if school districts don't provide transportation, uh, that's uh, where they can get an exemption. Um, just as if it was like a horrible blizzard that shut down all the roads or whatnot. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, there you go. Learn something new every day in this uh, school transportation industry. Excellent. Well, Ryan, I know you're working really hard on STN Expo out in Indianapolis and Reno. Lots happening there. The agenda is coming together for this summer. Guys, if you haven't registered yet, be sure to go to stnexpo.com. We've got East out in Indianapolis, May 31st through June 4th, and then STN Expo West in Reno, Nevada, and that's uh, July 12th through the 17th. We still got some early bird and super early bird discounts. Not not many days left for Reno. I think it's uh, the last day is the 12th to lock in that $200 saving. So make sure you uh, go on there quickly, lock that in and uh, make sure you catch all the great content, networking, social affairs, uh, lots of friends and colleagues going to be there to learn a lot about what's happening in the green energy, technology, uh, operations, safety, security. There's just so much to take in. Uh, we got our 
our transportation director summit as well. Great leadership event. If you haven't signed up for that, if you're a leader in your organization, uh, tdsummit.com, more information on that as well. So we got, we got websites and conferences galore coming this summer, Ryan. That's absolutely correct. And uh, now's the time to uh, get online, register, see what we have planned. Wonderful. All right. What other top headlines we got going this week, Ryan? Yeah, well, uh, last week, uh, there was a webinar um, that uh, was on stnonline.com. It was uh, brought to you by First Student, uh, and it was looking at uh, a really interesting bit of technology. I shouldn't call it a bit of technology. It's, it's really innovative, um, and you know, it's really designed to ease this whole transition to zero emissions. Uh, so some of you might remember our inaugural uh, STN Innovator of the Year Award went to Alex Cook from First Student. He's the chief engineer there. That was in 2022. Um, and, you know, shameless plug, we'll be awarding our 2024 winner here in a couple months, Tony, uh, in, on the July issue. So so stay tuned for that. Um, but Alex and his team, uh, they were recognized for developing a scalable cost-effective battery infrastructure design. And they really unpacked it for us in this in this webinar last week. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's basically simplifying the the access and the uh, installation of these chargers so a lot of school districts uh they face some really um long and expensive construction on their their parking lots uh talking trenching and you know building out all these new power lines and whatnot and this kind of you know behind meter getting the, the power that they need to their to their um lots but that obviously entails a lot of planning, a, a lot of, like I mentioned, construction work, a lot of money, a lot of downtime. And uh, what Alex and his team there at First Student have developed is they've developed um, this uh, package, really, of, of charging where it's this self-contained package. Um, you know, we have these big Connex freight trailers. They ship everything out. There's the, the, the chargers, everything you need. I mean, this whole entire system. Uh, and uh, it, it avoids all of this, a lot of this construction and trenching. You can put up these jersey barriers barriers on those big concrete blocks that sometimes you see on freeways or in construction zones um, and they mount right on there and it can be done in 14 to 16 weeks as opposed to a year uh, that's what Alex was telling us uh, so really interesting a lot of cost savings as I mentioned uh, and this is available you know first student obviously is the largest school bus contractor in the nation they're they're, they're moving millions of kids a, a day um, so this is obviously something that's available to their customers but you know like a lot of companies first student now has its uh, consulting arm uh, so they have first consulting and so this is really an option that's available to, to anyone it's interesting to me, Ryan, the 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 way EV technology is advancing and obviously first student being the largest and really out there kind of first. And obviously, Alex being the STN innovator of the year for was that 2020, 2022, 2022. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was a few years ago, but we chose him particularly based on all the innovations that he had been looking at. And look at this. Here we go. Two years later you see the progress that's being made. You see the momentum Two in two years, there has been an extreme amount of momentum around battery electric vehicles in school transportation. I mean, stuff we would have never have thought like we were prognosticating, but here it is. And these guys are looking at what are the big challenges, trying to be prescriptive with solving challenges with technology. And some of this technology didn't even exist. Mm -hmm, and now here it is being developed. That's where we go to things like the ACT Expo to see what the trend is in some of these other vocational spaces. And how can that apply to school transportation? Same thing with Green Bus Summit at STN Expo. We're looking to our manufacturers, putting together panels, looking at these deep dives of how 
how are people really leveraging the technology? And now we've got a lot more use cases of people running multiple miles, right? I got a press release, uh, Thomas built buses, wasn't it? A million miles run by their jewelry. Mm -hmm. So that was a couple of weeks ago. So we're going to see more and more millions of miles racking up for OEMs that are really going to tell the tale of how the technology is succeeding in the market, right? They want to try to paint that picture. And so it's exciting. You know, I see bus, they're furthering their, their technology and they're launching their brand new vehicles as well. So we see a lot of action in this right now. So it's, it's a very cool space to see it develop. But as you said, does it stand on its own without the federal subsidy? And that mm -hmm. is like the scariest part about this whole thing is everybody's ramping up. Everybody's making these huge capital investments in manufacturing. And there is a big unknown at the end of this money train that's going to end in what, two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to see where the cards land because the states can only fund it to a certain degree. Um, we are seeing obviously New York and California throw a lot of money at it, but what does it really mean for the future of electrification? So time will only tell. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, you know, like with that, a lot of uh, overwhelming, I think, is kind of the, the, the word. And Nate and I talk about that in a little bit um, in our interview. Uh, but it is, it is a very interesting um, and exciting time, as you said. But it is one fraught with a lot of anxiety. And their solutions, uh, solutions are kind of going to come to the forefront. Um, that's the, the, uh, the capitalistic uh, democracy that we're in. Folks will innovate and they'll meet demand. Uh, now, how fast that happens, again, that's, you know, sometimes we're shocked at the, the speed of progress and then sometimes it doesn't happen as fast enough uh, as we need it to, but it happens. And, um, you know, things are shaking out right now. You know, it, it was was interesting to to learn more about um, the the first student uh, application. However, and and I know that um, in terms of like, you know mobile charging, you know we see other options on the market. I know that you know the Propane Education Research Council has uh, and they they've used it actually to um, power the electric vehicles at ACT Expo as well as at our Green Bus Summit ride and drives. Um, you know there are options because that's that's been the tripping point. Folks get, you know, if they're able to get this money, they get the buses. You know, a lot of these folks, as I mentioned, they're they're facing a year plus from their utilities to to get all the power and all the construction needed to get the infrastructure and the chargers installed. And districts just can't wait that long. So, you know, um, certainly the good news is there are options. And I think we're only going to see more options as we move forward. All right, Ryan, SC Next will be in right around the corner. That means it's time for Top Transportation Teams Award. Guys, are you a top transportation team? Don't keep it to yourself. Get the recognition you and your team members deserve by enrolling in the Top Transportation Teams Award program. Guess what? Our friends at TransFinder launched this Top Transportation Teams program last year and had great success. Six teams from across North America received special recognition and were honored at STN Expo West in Reno. They got complimentary tickets, accommodations, tons of media attention. You don't even have to be a TransFinder client, though I'm sure you'd love to be. Contractors are also encouraged to enroll in this award. Visit toptransportationteams.com to learn more. Why should you enroll? Bragging rights for sure, but your team will also learn from other school districts and private fleet contractors on how to become the best team they can be better than ever enrollment ends may 3rd so get started today visit top transportation teams.com all right just popping back in uh, i know we touched on it late last week ryan the ghg phase three rolled out more details i know when we were recording we didn't have all the details and now we do and there's been lots of comments from the industry from oem suppliers uh so what's kind of the the breakdown what do people need to know for ghg phase three well, it uh, goes into effect for model years 27 through 32. Uh, the feds, you know, obviously pointing to uh, the health benefits, the, com the community society benefits, 1 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions removed from the air, 
uh, 13 billion in annualized net benefits to society, you know, related to public health and climate and savings as well for truck owners and operators. Uh, but that, of course, um, as we were just talking about, there's still a lot of anxiety out there. We see the prices of these vehicles increasing. Uh, so as the EPA now closes its book on its clean truck rule, so we had phase one. We go back to 2011, if you remember, Tony, uh, phase two, 2016, 17 timeframe, and then now we have uh, phase three. Uh, so it's what's interesting is it's not mandating or requiring zero emissions, but it's really pushing folks in that direction. And as we know, uh, the more that uh, um, and, th and this is phased in. So every year there's going to be uh, more stringent requirements on NOx, uh, greenhouse gases, particulate matter, um, those smog forming um, agents. Uh, so as we know, um, you know, as we move uh, more toward requiring uh, stricter emissions from engines, that uh, that is basically meaning that we're going the zero emissions route. Uh, it does give some flexibility, and I know that uh, you know the manufacturers have some flexibility. There's still some some mention in there of, of being able to use some some credits, uh, but uh, definitely the writing is on the wall as we've been talking about and we've known for a while that uh, really everything is going toward zero emissions. And you know, I, I, I when I talk to Nate in a little bit, um, he touches on this. And, and we talk about, uh, you know, beyond simply this, there's the states like California and New York that are really driving this, Tony, that are requiring a certain percentage or all of, of, their, of their school bus, at least new purchases, to be zero emissions by a certain year. And it really jives with that 2027, at least in the New York standpoint, with what, with what EPA is doing. And there are some similar requirements in California with its advanced clean trucks rule. Um, and some, some fleets, not really school buses, but um, some fleets as early as, as this and next year um, need to start going towards zero emissions. So, um, you know, it's it, uh, it, it's still. Uh, I think the feds are still trying to wrap their their heads around the the, the costs and the infrastructure, uh, and, and trying to uh, grease those wheels as as best as they can. Uh, but certainly, you know, um, you look at the enormous investments. Uh, in zero emissions technology from the likes of of Cummins and all of the school bus OEMs uh, the the day is coming uh, and uh, you know but but in the meantime uh, school districts and and you know school bus operators they need to develop that plan we need all these different fuels of course to to get us there um, but certainly as as Nate talks about in a little bit school districts really need to plan um, how they're going to uh, adopt and adapt uh, to these new technologies. And a lot has come out that we've reported about and talked about, Tony, in terms of planning fleets. I know the feds, the Department of, of, of Energy um, has, has a tool now and the, all the OEMs uh, to a T almost, they have these consulting arms. And the, what, I, what I keep hearing and seeing over and over is the importance of analyzing your fleet uh you know analyze everything about it the the terrain you know where you're located the temperature the geography of of the district uh what your power needs are how do you calculate your power needs um based upon your your fleet replacement cycle um the infrastructure you know nate talks so much about the importance of working with your utilities and having a, a relationship with them that goes above and beyond you know, what a normal school district relationship has traditionally been with it, its utility. Uh, so, you know, now is, is, as we were saying earlier, it's an exciting time, but it's a, a very anxious time. So speaking of which, Tony, my interview with Nate is coming up next. But first, a message from our sponsor. This message is brought to you by Student Transportation of America, a leader in school transportation services. STA operates more than 22,000 vehicles throughout the U.S. and Canada, delivering safe and reliable transportation and fleet services to school districts of all sizes. STA is committed to moving the industry toward a greener future and positively impacting the health of passengers and the planet through their use of electric vehicles, alternative fuels, and other green fleet initiatives. 
To learn how STA may be able to help your district, visit RideSTA.com. That's RideSTA.com. We are back and happy to be joined now by our good friend, Nate Springer, Vice President of Market Development at the TRC Company, formerly known as Gladstein Neandros and Associates, the producer of the Alternative Clean Transportation or ACT Expo. Nate, um, thank you for joining us and sharing your wisdom about especially zero emission school buses. Thank you so much, Ryan, for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, uh, TRC Company, that is a new company that acquired uh, the former Gladstein, Neandros and & Associates. And uh, ACT Expo, um, it was amazing. We were talking before we started recording. It goes all the way back to 2011. I think we first got involved about 2013 or 14. I think that was maybe around the time that you um, joined yeah, I started uh, attending and I brought a, a group of fleet owners uh, in the early uh, 2010s time frame. Uh, we were really interested in, in learning about all of these technologies. We had UPS and Walmart and a number of others. Um, none of them, unfortunately, were, were school bus operators. Uh, but a lot of these technologies are really cross-cutting for, for all different types of fleet operators. School buses are near and dear to my heart because both of my parents were teachers. I've got a two and a half year old who will be be going to school in, in the not so distant future. And so the revolution that we're seeing in clean technologies and school buses is just really exciting. And it's, it's come so far in the last 10, 12 years here. Absolutely. And I think it was, I remember the first year or two of ACT Expo. It used to be held at the Long Beach Convention Center, about maybe 20, 25 minutes from our office here in Torrance, California. Uh, and I remember there was maybe one school bus on the, on the mm -hmm. floor, maybe two. And last year, uh, you guys moved down to a larger space in Anaheim. This year, even larger. I mean, you guys are growing by leaps and bounds. You're going to be in Las Vegas. Uh, so the Las Vegas Convention Center, not quite a full takeover, but dang close to it. Um, there's school buses everywhere. You know, it really has been amazing to see uh, uh, that proliferation. And as you you touched on, I mean, you know, school buses uh, are, you know, based off of the, the, the trucking platforms. Um, now we're seeing a lot more, you know, uh, monocoque uh, bodies um, and, and built from the ground up. Um, but, you know, definitely the evolution. So, so when you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, because you had mentioned when you you had first started going to ACT Expo, um, what is your background in in trucking or in in clean transportation? Yeah, it's a good question. You you wonder, you know, fifteen years in, how you wandered into this and became uh, became immersed at the the forefront of the industry. I I have a background in sustainability and ESG actually, but uh, by way of that work and and work directly with a number of uh, of very large uh, fleet and logistics and freight operators, UPS and FedEx and Walmart and and others, uh, ended up learning a lot about emissions reductions, especially greenhouse gas emissions reductions and all of the various technologies associated with uh, both the the vehicles and their drivetrains, everything from diesel to propane to natural gas to battery electric and even hydrogen fuel cell now um, but but also the fuel content and because that's that's a big uh, part of the story of uh, of bringing more clean solutions clean air uh, cleaner and and more stable climate to market by having renewable fuels such as renewable natural gas, renewable propane, renewable electricity, that and even renewable diesel as as uh, as a part of the mix. So I've been working in this arena for now 10, 15 years, uh, doing very much this type of uh, helping to build the market. A lot of my focus, uh, I came to GNA now TRC about five years ago, 2019, and a lot of my focus is really on educating the marketplace. So I run an initiative called the State of Sustainable fleets. Every year we do a comprehensive data collection and analysis. We, we do really the largest survey of its kind annually of fleet operators on their uses of these technologies. And then we unveil all the results and the findings every year live at ACT Expo. This is our fifth year doing it. Uh, so we're very excited about that milestone, Trying really trying to set the record straight because at, at any new technology, uh, is it takes a lot to learn. 
and and there's a lot going on in this industry. It, it, as you uh, hinted, Ryan, it, it's really exploding. We're getting a lot of investment, a lot of new entrants. It's really hard for fleet operators to to stay ahead of all of it, and that's why we host Act Expo once a year, bring the entire industry together, let people come see, touch, experience the technology, go to educational workshops. It's why I put together the State of Sustainable Fleets, run this group of fleet uh, fleet operators called the Fleet Forums that they can share best practice uh, and everybody can can try and stay as much ahead of these technologies, work through the pain points quicker than uh, you might otherwise if you didn't have these resources. Mm-hmm, absolutely. So um, with that, that state of sustainable fleets, uh, we I have reported on it over the years. Um, would ask, I mean, you know, I know it's coming out, it's probably top secret, but if there's any insights you can you can share, um, I'm sure there, there's there's certain things in there that aren't going to come as a surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I believe infrastructure is, you know, top of mind and probably the, the still issue that um, folks are, are trying to deal with in terms of getting zero emission vehicles deployed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. Certainly on the zero emission side. Let, let, uh, to be clear, we we really track uh, the the two leading, I'll call them clean air drive trains for uh, for schools and school uh, bus operators. Our propane has has been around for a while, and it does a great job of dramatically reducing the the emissions, the the tailpipe emissions that you know have an impact on the the students while they're riding the bus. But so do the battery electrics, and and those two technologies have really emerged as, as really the dominant ones. Uh, when it comes to propane, their infrastructure really isn't that much of an issue, and even yeah. price for that matter, because you most of these fleet operators, school districts from Michigan to Oregon, Allegan County, Michigan, just transition to uh, propane-powered uh, vehicles and think they're going to cut their fuel costs by 50%. Uh, Beaverton, Oregon's using renewable uh, propane. But we also are seeing, as you hinted, a, a big trend and a push more by policymakers, I think, and maybe certain urban districts towards zero emission as well. They, they there are definitely this is the new entrant in in this uh, in the school bus space. Infrastructure is is a big challenge, and and uh, we certainly saw over the last couple of years how supply chain snarls uh, were really delaying deliveries of a lot of uh, the the actual hardware, some of the software integrations, etc. Uh, some of the uh, the leading and even startup uh, vehicle OEMs. Uh, so think Bluebird, but think also some of the other ones like uh, Green Power and, and others who are doing school buses, um, battery electric school buses. They were building those uh, those production lines and the, that capacity. And so deliveries have been a little slower as well. Um, and it's very difficult to time that that delivery of your vehicle with the actual infrastructure. There's a, a, It's an entirely new approach to fueling when you're using electricity. You have to have a very established and maintain a very tight relationship with your local utility, um, usually more than than your standard just, you know, running your offices and schools would require uh, the types of relationships we're seeing now uh, to, to help get funding from the utility, get funding from the state to help install those, and then after you've lined up the funding and then lining up the timeline. Sometimes these these projects, if you wanted to, for example, I'm in Bend, Oregon, my school district has got to have close to 100 buses at their site there. Now, to electrify all of that, that's, you know, a, a several megawatts of electricity. And those are big projects for utilities, usually five years, 10 years for for a big project like that. Now, if you're doing one or two buses, it shouldn't be as much of a challenge. But infrastructure is really the, the, the name of the game now when we're talking battery electric buses and fleet managers, uh, school fleet managers and transportation managers are having to learn this new capability. Yeah, we had uh, uh, Kim Crabtree, who's the director of Ben Lapine School District. I think it was just the, the, right there in your in your backyard. She was yep. out at uh, Expo Reno last year, talking about just the initial ushering in of electric and, and yep. some of the the, the challenges. And um, I want to get back to what you were talking about propane, but also when you were talking about renewable diesel too. Um, so now with propane, I don't imagine your sustainable fleets uh, report is going to have a lot in there. Where uh, for school bus and for others. There is really only one game in town 
uh, in in terms of the the propane system, at least for the next couple of years, Roush Clean Tech, the Bluebird product, mm-hmm. um, hearing that uh, you know obviously Cummins is working on their mm-hmm. fuel agnostic engine. They have their Octane coming out first. Propane is going to come out after that. But hearing there are some delays with Octane, so. You know, I don't know if uh, what you're hearing from the fleets that that you talk to, you know, there's some big decisions to be made. Do they go to, if if they're not a Bluebird customer, do they go to Bluebird? How much do the dealers, they they play a big role in in a lot of that selection process and preferred preferred vehicles. Um, So... Uh, obviously, that's not uh, picture perfect for where we are right now. We would right. like to have more propane offerings on the market. Yeah, I, I agree, and and we definitely understand how uh, challenging, how, how much of a of a uh, you know you you've kind of hit it on the head. If you've only got one offer, and and fleet operators, of course, like to have a couple of different solutions and and reliable OEMs that they trust and infrastructure providers that they trust. So it's it is a challenge. I think one of the things that's that came out loud and clear as we were preparing this year's uh, state of sustainable fleets, which will be uh, we'll, I can preview some of the findings, but they'll be fully live at Act Expo. Is that um, we're we're in a period, probably for the next few years, of just a lot of confusion, and it it's maybe going to be the toughest time in terms of trying to decide in the face of the the, the probably the highest amount of uncertainty around what the market is and isn't going to do about what regulators are and aren't going to do, what funding is going to be available. It absolutely affects school districts on both the propane side and, as you've hinted, and the battery electric side. So for um, – I wouldn't necessarily call uh, Cummins uh, delays their, their their plan. I think they are uh, – the, w- the way we've understood it and we really looked into it this year what is that they're just being very thoughtful about their product rollout. They're trying to time it. They have learned from previous generations of new newer drivetrains, uh, notably natural gas, uh, the first rollout, well, not the first, but their big rollout of the nine liter and the 12 liter in the 20, 10, 11, 12, 13 timeframe, that they just have to be very thoughtful about how they do it. And I think they're, the, the way they've explained it to us on the propane side is that they're they're going to try and time it to updates to their their gasoline, their uh, both diesel and gasoline so that they can reduce confusion in the marketplace and they can stand by both on the, the product side, but also the aftermarket side and have those networks in place. So that doesn't make it any easier for a fleet operator right now. I would say in terms of you know the reliability and the and the the commitment certainly that Roush and Bluebird have made on the on their propane systems. It's it's worth noting. You know those are reliable, good standby solutions. They also can do a lot of the the aftermarket uh, type conversions, and the infrastructure is is just incredibly easy to install or to remove. And so that helps to de-risk it for fleet operators who are are trying to say, hey, do I delay? Do I delay? You know you if if you need to make purchases, propane's still a very good, solid choice for you. And and it's not like you're making a, you know, I know uh, school districts in particular like to keep and hold on to their assets for a lot longer. Um, but there's every evidence that, that those assets will be viable, that they'll be within compliance in almost every state, e- even in places like California, where there's, there's a transition going on to ZEVs um, for, you know, at least the next 10, 12, 15 years. So uh, I I would say with Roush and Bluebird standing behind their technologies and they've made great products and then the ease of installing or, or uninstalling propane infrastructure um, and the ability probably to resell those in other markets if you are regulated out of it, uh, it's, it's, not a, it, it's not a terrible risk to take. Okay, so Nate, uh, what about the role of renewable diesel? Uh, because we know that uh, folks are saying, hey, we need a lot of different fuels to get us to where we need to be. A lot of folks obviously have diesel right now, renewable diesel is plug and play, but yet we had the EPA phase three GHG rule come out. Um, now, not outlawing diesel, but it's definitely pushing towards zero emissions. We're going to see costs of diesel just continue to increase, and likely a lot of manufacturers are going to, you know, over the years, going to be producing fewer and fewer diesel. So, you know, where, where does that st- 
stand um, in terms of this all fuels uh, migration? Yeah, you know, renewable diesel is is a great solution if you can get it at, at to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. If you can get it at the same or even in some cases below the price of uh, of diesel, that only really seems to be the case right now in these the, the West Coast states, so Oregon, Washington, and California. And as you just mentioned, uh, now New Mexico has finalized and announced that they are going to develop what they call a low carbon fuel standard, or that's what California calls their program. Every state's got a different name for it. And and what those do is they basically create a marketplace so that the fuel providers can um, can get paid to, to offer more uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions, lower carbon fuels and energy sources uh, to fleet owners who, who use it in their in their vehicles. It's actually getting paid to uh, to use it more or less. And so it's a fantastic solution and one that the uh, has been a, a success story in the sense that you know there's a there's an enormous amount of supply that's already come online in the last couple of years and coming online in the na- next couple of years. It has uh, and is something that anyone who's in one of those states should absolutely be considering as part of their greenhouse gas emissions reductions plan. Now you you kind of put this into the context of all of these other you know machinations that are going on with uh, with regulators in California at the EPA and such. And, you know, if you're outside of California or, or I guess now New York, where, you know, they're mandating school districts all have to go zero emission eventually. And, and even in those states, it's a fairly long time frame. You're, you're absolutely going to be looking at a period of time that we think after 20, starting with model year 2027, which is when the EPA's clean, both their new greenhouse gas phase three and the clean trucks plan all kick in. And the clean trucks plan will require around 80% reduction in, uh, I think it's NOx emissions and something like 50% in particulate matter emissions. So all those air, you know, the fumes and the exhaust and such dramatic reductions. What what this era is going to be that we think is is really kicking in around that time and due to those regulations is that, as you, you hinted, that the price of operating and purchasing new diesel vehicles, model year 2027 beyond, is going to be higher. And and that's all part of this broader landscape that, uh, as you as you hinted, you know, the the idea is that the the regulators are setting performance metrics that traditional diesel vehicles just aren't really equipped to meet. And therefore, the engine makers are having to do a lot of modifications. It introduces complexity. It may introduce some more maintenance requirements and more downtime, et cetera, with the the overall impact that the cost of, of, of operating diesel is likely to be a lot more expensive. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I heard, I mean, diesel can be to your point, but I've heard like there's homogenous diesel, but to produce it is just so expensive that no one <laughs> is, is ever going to put that much R and D into something as we've seen that, you know, the, the runway is not that long. I do want to hit on New York before I let you go. Cause you, you mentioned it. Um, New York, 2027, you mentioned when the EPA phase three GHG rules go into effect in New York, 2027, at least as of today, um, here in April 2024, uh, by 2027, school districts will need to, if they, when they purchase new school buses, they have to be zero emissions. And today that means battery electric. Um, we've written articles. Uh, we talked to the you know, nice Serta, which is the, the agency up there. That's kind of like their environmental group, um, that is funding a lot of, of this migration. Um, what about there in New York? What are you hearing in terms of, you know, they're, because they're not ostensibly going to have the option to go propane or renewable diesel. They're going to have to go battery electric. So I know that there's a lot of, uh, anxiety <laughs> we'll put it that way in in new york school districts right now yeah and you probably have more insight into new york specifically i tend to look more national and, and then also california just because that's that tends to be the, the bigger market driving most of this um you know look at uh so if if the requirement actually requires from model year tour rather yeah 2027 onwards that the school districts then purchase exclusively uh, then their new vehicles be zero emissions. This is absolutely a, a, a challenge and we're seeing this somewhat 
outside in California with the passage of this advanced clean fleet rule that uh, that that kicks in for some fleets as early as this year and a lot of fleets, even more fleets next year in 2027, that there are big questions about the supply. Um, now, great news. Uh, Bluebird, uh, as you probably reported, has had announced that they'd already just sold in the past year their 1500th uh, battery electric bus. Um, you know, we've we've still got the uh, the Julie brand, the IC brand that's that are producing and starting to ramp up and, and scale up. But I think it's it's a real challenge and and there it it, it could create the potential for a land grab uh, of source for vehicles, right? That the vehicles are are really in uh, short supply to meet the demand. I think it's what fifty thousand buses or, or or such in New York. Yeah, there, there's 50, 45,000, I think, in yeah. the fleet. And so, yeah, I've done some math and I think it, it's, you know, they, they have to several thousand at least a year starting today, right. you know, and I know that there are some exemptions or, or some some delays that are that are available at least for a couple of years for certain school districts, uh, especially rural ones, or if they right. can mention their hardship doing it. Um, but yeah, in, in the industry wide, you know, you mentioned Bluebird. Bluebird has a dedicated electric plant now. Lion obviously opened up their plant in Joliet, Illinois last year. Green Power has theirs in Virginia. Mm-hmm. Do you think that we're going to start seeing more and more manufacturing that's solely whether it be a facility, like a new facility at some of these OEMs, or just where um, you know more and more of the obviously the uh, the production has to go to these BVs to meet the demand, because we have on a good year forty thousand school buses need to be made a year, forty five thousand. And we, it seems like it's going to be a far time before we can hit that number yeah. where all forty five thousand are are battery electric. Right. But and, you know, not every fleet is going to replace their entire they've got their procurement cycles. Right. And so maybe Mm -hmm. you replace five percent this year, five percent next year. or Maybe it's every three years you're doing, you know, 20 percent or or 10 percent, whatever that number is. But but ultimately, you know, every district and every fleet operator has to has to start making their plans. And if you're in a place like New York or, or California, you you in this case with the the high levels of uncertainty and the potential for maybe there's some delays, maybe there isn't even enough supply to, to your point and, and the regulators will figure that out and, and be accommodating. Either way, we certainly recommend that, that people, the fleet managers start planning and have at least one plan that looks at, okay, let's say nothing changes and we got to meet this regulation and have another plan that says, okay, if we could do it more on a timeline that were uh, that was, was more suitable to, to our needs. Needs and, and our cost savings, then uh, that's what uh, that's how you deal with those kinds of situations. Mm-hmm. And within that plan, a plan obviously looking at um, your existing needs and how does that factor into going battery electric fleet, you know, fleet analysis, route analysis, yep. all those things, your weather, everything. You know, it's like you said, it's it's a uh, it's a it's an interesting time. Well, and I'd, I'd add, I think maybe, and this is one of the other things we'll be, be talking a lot about at Expo, certainly in State of Sustainable Fleets, is if for fleet managers who haven't been uh, paying close attention to uh, these alternative fuels, these clean fuels and, and drivetrains and the manufacturers putting their uh, their investments behind them, now's the time. It's, it's you know, this is clearly not a fad that is going away. And and, and whether you're in the middle of Missouri or New York and California, you know, Oregon, Washington, uh, it, these are technologies, many of which like propane for school districts can actually save you money, can actually help you meet local air quality needs. Make sure your kids, are, uh, especially those with the with conditions like asthma and, and heart conditions, uh, arrive to school and are safe and, and, and clean, uh, have good air, clean air to breathe and can do it while saving costs. So this is really Really, an era. I think, even though we, it's it's a it's a tough time in the sense that there's going to be a just ton of uncertainty and ambiguity that you and I have been talking about. Now, it's also the time for every fleet manager to say, okay, wh- which uh, we need to evaluate the technologies, all of the portfolio of technologies, and start thinking about which ones we slot in. And they'll be surprised that there's going to be a number of maybe even individual routes or uh, applications or locations or entire school districts are going to say, hey, look, this technology is actually better than what I've got, and I may as well start my replacement. 
replacement plan and whether that's propane or, or battery electric, um, you know, the, the ones who are getting out there ahead of it are, are also being very creative about capitalizing on funding. I know uh, you and I chatted about my local school district, Bend, and, and they work very closely with both the state and their local utility. I don't know how much of that they got funded, uh, but it's a significant price difference for the, the battery electric uh, type C. But I know they got a lot of it uh, funded and probably a lot of the infrastructure as well. A lot, a lot of programs out there. Well, you know, Nate, looking forward to ACT Expo. It's going to be May 20th through the 23rd out there in the Las, Las Vegas. Vegas Convention Center. Almost said Long Beach. You know, looking forward to it and looking forward to the, your, the state of sustainable fleets. Um, I think there's going to be some great reading in there. Yeah, please join us if you haven't made your plans already. Uh, we're going to have the the BYD Type A battery electric, the Julie uh, Thomas built C2 Julie. That we'll we'll have the green power motors, uh, Beast Mega Beast school bus, uh, all electric, and of course IC is going to be there. There's others in the works that I can't yet announce, but uh, they'll all Ooh, be there, and, and we'll have good representation. I think the CEO of First Student is speaking. We've got uh, their their head of electrification who's speaking on another panel. So it'll be great. Absolutely. Yeah, there's going to be a session on May uh, 22nd, Mm -hmm. Achieving School Bus Electrification. So going to be there with my notepad. So Nate, looking forward to it. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us and and, uh, uh, spreading the word and, and your expertise. Brian, thank you for the work that you do too. A special thanks to Ryan and Nate for joining us on the episode. Really appreciate you both sharing your insights. Great conversation today, Ryan. Interesting headlines as well. Guys, don't forget, you can go to stnonline.com for all the latest updates, news, analysis that we have to offer. Also, our April issue is available if you haven't read it yet. Uh, the latest and greatest, go to stnonline.com. Click on that magazine tab. We're also got on our homepage, down that right column. Just click on it. we got uh, our April administrator superintendent issue got the asa superintendent of the year on there along with claire miller from first student so great cover great stories uh special thanks to our sponsors this week as well the podcast transfinder ic bus and student transportation of america appreciate you guys for being on here and supporting the podcast guys don't forget visit our sponsors show them some love let them know we sent you over to them guys also subscribe to the podcast apple podcast spotify wherever you listen to pods nation get it all here the latest and greatest in school transportation news and analysis nation we love you we'll see you next week